much. So welcome to the last part uh, of my lecture, still going on with uh, electrical impedance tomography, uh, with a nonlinear inverse problem and some nonlinear PDE methods for regularized solution. So yesterday we already covered uh, the definition, the basic idea, the low pass filtering resulting in some blurring. Uh, I told you about these CGO solutions for the Schrodinger equation. These ones that have an exponential behavior. And we also saw how to compute them numerically. So today, let's take a look at how to prove that this is a regularization strategy. Like I told, there are very few actually in the literature regularization strategies for nonlinear PDE coefficient problems, but this is one of them. So this is the framework, and we should, we should define a continuous map from the data space that approximately reconstructs the conductivity from uh, the noisy measurement. And recall that this is what we want. We want to define this guy so that uh, for the increased position data, when alpha goes to zero, we get, uh, in the limit, we get a perfect reconstruction. And in the practical case, if we have noisy data and we apply our method with the parameter chosen as a function of the noise level, the worst case error should tend to zero. So this was the structure of the proof. So let's look at this one more time, what's going on here. So first of all, we have to solve a boundary integral equation uh, for functions defined uh, at the boundary. We have here a Faday single layer operator. Here we have the noisy data, which is not the dedicated Neumann map for any conductivity in general, and this is the DN map for no genuine conductivity. So we need to show that this is uh, still solvable, this equation. at least for small enough uh, noise levels. There the idea is that because we know that this one is solvable, then for small enough delta and small enough k, also this one will be solvable. And we can find the solvability radius in the k space quite explicitly as a function of the noise level. Then outside the stable disk, we put the scattering transform to zero. And inside, we use the noisy, noisy trace from the noisy equation. We use the noisy data again here. And integrate, we get some function here, which we plug as a coefficient in this complex value d bar equation, which is a kind of a pseudo analytic function equation. Uh, and then we solve this one. And finally, we put the k to 0 and square. This is the method of how to proceed. So why would this be a regularization strategy? Well, first of all, first we knew the numerics. We saw that that's what seems to be happening. So we want, wanted to give an official proof of it. And for the proof, we need to make precise assumptions, of course. So actually, um, things are not quite perfect yet. It would be nice to prove this for let's say piecewise constant or piecewise smooth conductivities. This is an open problem still to show that such a regularization exists. We have to assume a couple of uh, continuous derivatives in sigma. So while the model space is really the L infinity uh, over omega, this domain of the forward map we define such that they are a bit more uh, smooth functions bounded from above also bounded away from zero and one near the boundary. And the data space, uh, this is the natural space from the uh, elliptic theory. And in addition, there are a couple of things we know that every Dirichlet Neumann map satisfies. So these ones uh, uh, we also include. So this one is pretty much that. Uh, if we put Dirichlet data 1, then 
the solution to Pd is constant 1, its normal derivative is 0. And this one, uh, Sigma says that when we integrate over the uh, current through the boundaries, the integral is 0 because of conservation of charge. So we can also impose those extra conditions. So this is the framework where we prove regularization. This is our proof. So if you are given noisy data, so not necessarily any D and map, this is just an operator uh, in the data space. And it is, we know that it's at most epsilon away from the Higgin position data. Then uh, we choose a truncation radius in the nonlinear Fourier space explicitly with this formula. So then you see that there was a requirement that when uh, epsilon goes to zero, alpha must go to zero. So with these two definitions, that will be the case. And then we actually not only prove that the worst case error goes to zero at the limit, we also give an explicit bound. <laughs> not, not, not a very uh, good bound, but anyway, I mean, it's a bit more than just the limit. It, there, is, there is an explicit bound. So let's see how this is proven. So we, it's kind of a, like perturbation theory a bit. We have, we have uh, this noisy data away from the perfect data. So things that needs to be done is uh, look at the solutions of the D-bar equation with two a bit different functions here. So there are a couple of different kernel functions here. What will be the difference in the corresponding solutions? That's something we need to control. And also here, uh, what happens when we, because we know when this is the infinite precision data, not one proof that this is nicely perfectly solvable and it's well understood, but now we have something a bit different here. Uh, sorry for the epsilon and delta changing all the time. Not as really correct. Anyway, this is a perturbation of the infinite precision data, so then we should also be able to somehow control the difference between the perfect solution and this noisy solution. So we need a few lemmas from that. This is this is more more uh, simple case because this is Fredholm operator of the second kind. Uh, it's kind of um, not so easy to get control on it because the solvability is proven by a Fredholm argument. Okay. So first of all, this is about a difference of the solutions of the D-bar equation. If we have two different uh, functions here. So we see that uh, if we measure the difference of, of these two functions in, in such a norm, in such a function space, uh, so it's uh, I think on both sides of two these guys, so one is less than two, another one is bigger than two, so then we can bound actually these guys in a further norm. <coughs> And this is actually, we just looked at the literature and we could find many, many results about solving this equation. So we just combine some results to find this. All in all, in, in the whole D-bar method, the thing is that this, this D-bar solution, D-bar equation solution is a stable step. I mean, everything there is pretty stable and nice. All the ill positiveness and difficulties, they actually are in, in the phases going from the boundary measurements to the traces of the CGO solutions. That's the really ill post and difficult part. Uh, this one is usually kind of stable and nice. Then we have a couple of uh, lemmas we did, did uh, for this project. Uh, we had to take a careful look at how the Fadel Green's function uh, behaves. So we had to bound the single layer operator. See, the bound is not. not uh, very nice, I mean, it grows in K uh, exponentially, so. Um, but uh, in the stable disk near the origin, this is still useful for us. Because, you know, when there is more noise, anyway, we have to work with K closer to zero. So, so we can still deal with this kind of bound. And then for this inverse of this Fredholm operator, we also get such bounds of exponential type.
Then uh, here we are uh, first of all proving that we still can, can uh, solve this equation for small enough noise levels. So this is still solvable because it's, it's then close actually to Nachman's situation and we can use these estimates to kind of extend Nachman's results to a little bit perturbed uh, equation. And also there from this from the analysis of this one we, we find that that this is this is where we can solve the boundary integral equation. And then uh, analyzing the difference in the in the perfect trace re related to this one and this noisy guy related to this one, where we an analyze the difference between them and then look at the boundary integral, the second step, uh, which is analyze the differences here, and then it, this is a uh, much simpler step because this is just integration. Uh, then we can actually see that we can bound uh, the, the difference between these guys, the noisy T of K and this one, but inside the stable disk. So there will be some uh, like technical terms up here. So then, what all needs to be proven, so first of all, for the infinite position data, well, this is pretty much done in Nachman's paper already. I mean, this is, if you have the infinite position data, then Nachman's uh, constructive reconstruction technique essentially already gives this part. We just had to be very careful looking at the LP exponents, so it was kind of a game with, with small intervals and stuff like that, but, but it could be done. This one just comes directly from, from the, the simple definition uh, connecting alpha and R. And then this is now maybe the most, uh, most difficult part, but we now have the estimates for it, because everything boils down to uh, looking at the difference of these two guys, because mu is the infinite position guy, and we are approximating it with this guy, and when the noise level is going to zero, this truncation radius is going to infinity, uh, and we divide, we, so by, by lemma number one, estimating these solutions of the d-bar equation, we can estimate them by these kernel functions. This one we can divide into inside the disk and outside the disk, and outside the disk, this guy we put to zero, so we don't have it. Uh, this one can be bounded by, by uh, not much estimates, and for this one we had our own estimate, so then uh, some computations lead to the case that we can find the, find the uh, bound. Then, uh, so far everything was done for small enough uh, noise limit, noise size, but then uh, also uh, my Dear friend and colleague, Mark Pilassas used his analytic power and showed that with the spectral theoretic trick, you can actually extend the result then uh, to the whole data space. So that's pretty much it. So some analysis techniques used there and we could, we could prove that we have uh, a regularization strategy. Any questions about the regularization theory part. If not, let's then go, go to the how to really compute reconstructions with this deep bar method. This is something uh, you have a chance to try later today. Uh, we will give you all the codes and Min will we'll show you how to compute with this. So, first of all, we need to start with the boundary integral equation. That's the first step. When we are given uh, the data, we need to solve the boundary integral equation. And since we work with computers, we have to make everything finite. And now in this uh, situation, we work, uh, I think maybe I don't have it. So the idea is that, of course, in practice, everything is measured with this kind of current patterns. But we just now make the uh, approximation that we actually work with these Fourier bases, uh, which are defined uh, on, on the 
on the unit server. So we work with these in this talk, and I just mentioned that they, they are close to these, and this approximation is usually quite okay. So let's see. So we work with this standard Fourier style basis on the boundary on, on, on the unit circle. Of course, this could be done also with more general smooth boundaries, but let's let's uh, for simplicity let's stick to the unit circle. So then uh, we can represent functions as Fourier series like this, and for practical reasons we use uh, finite approximations. So we take some n here, and like we saw with the, with the current patterns, if you have n electrodes, then the maximum oscillation you can have is, is then n, over n divided by 2. So somehow the number of electrodes gives uh, a bound for this guy. So even if we work with these, these uh, continuous functions, we can still think that it's kind of practical to think that the number of electrodes will, will uh, limit this guy. So it's just the usual inner product, L2 inner product, we use this one, and then uh, we represent any operator we need in the equation by <coughs> looking at how it acts on the basis functions and then compute the inner product to other basis functions. So we, we uh, make, approximate every operator by a matrix. So for example, um, from the current to voltage measurements, and actually how we also simulate the data now in this, uh, in this MATLAB package uh, I'm giving you, there actually we solve the Neumann to Dirichlet uh, problem. So we apply Neumann data and solve for that one. It's a bit more stable and nice to compute. And then uh, I call the Neumann to Dirichlet map R, so we just compute these matrix elements, so we apply, we compute, solve the Neumann problem by plugging in each of the basis functions one by one, however, excluding the constant. The Neumann problem needs the Neumann data to integrate to zero. So, you see, I'm going here from frequency minus one to frequency plus one, so the zero frequency is not here. And the same here, uh, we, we don't have zero frequency here either. So we skip them, we make uh, this matrix for the Neumann to Dirichlet map, we invert this matrix, and then we add in the matrix, in the middle, we add uh, a row of zeros and a column of zeros corresponding to uh, the constant basis functions. This is actually like we saw before uh, here. For the Dirichlet Neumann map, we have these two things. That's why in the Dirichlet Neumann matrix, the middle row is zero, and the middle row is zero because of this one, and the middle column is zero uh, because of this one. So from boundary measurement, we get to the Dirichlet Neumann map. Then uh, we should be able to invert this one and apply it to this exponential. Well, the exponential we can expand in the Fourier basis. And this should be inverted. So let's see, what do we have here? We have the identity. Well, that's easy. It's just the uh, unit matrix of the right size. Uh, this one, I told you how to compute. And first, the n d map, and then invert and add, add these zeros. This one, we just have to compute. Uh, we need to evaluate these integrals for all the basis functions. Actually, I have already pre-computed that because my code for that one is pretty slow, although Janne has some new code, which is pretty fast. But anyway, uh, we have ready-made computed uh, the matrices for this guy. Let me just uh, recall to you that this is how the Fade Greens function looks like. So this is the Greens function for the Laplace operator. So of course it has a singularity at zero, but also then it has some, it's real valued. So this is just a, uh, well this is the usual logarithmic one. This is the Fade one. So they both have of course a singularity at the origin, 
but this guy is not rotationally symmetric and also has this kind of exponential behavior. So then again we compute this operator again by numerical integration, just element by element we compute it and lambda 1 for the homogeneous case because now we are dealing with these two-dimensional and perfect round uh, patients. So like I said, in practice <laughs> we should have uh, another person or an, <laughs> an object shaped exactly like the person we are measuring but homogeneous inside. Well, this we never had. There have to be some other ways of dealing with it. But in this simulated situation, when we work on the unit disk, we can compute by hand what is the matrix for lambda one. This is how it looks like, and I think you can easily see how it will extend for a bigger size. Just continue in the obvious way. Okay, so we have everything for solving for the traces of the CGO solutions. That's the step one. Step two is just integrating for getting the scattering transform. That's very simple by numerical integration. Uh, but then, how to solve the D bar equation? We use the same trick that I explained yesterday for the CGO solutions of the Schrodinger type. This time, uh, we take the disk of radius 2R and a little bit bigger square, and we tile the plane with those squares and start to think about periodic functions. So this is the full space lipman schwinger equation. Um, so this is the D-bar equation, an asymptotic condition, but if we combine these two, we actually can write uh, a lipman schwinger type equation like this where the Green's function that appears is, is actually uh, the Green's function for the D-bar operator, which is 1 over pi k. So that, that's the convolution part here. So we, well, we, again, like we did uh, in the Schrodinger case, we cut this Green's function a little bit outside the disk of radius 2. We write a periodic equation of the same type with the same or similar arguments, we can see that the solution of the periodic equation coincides with the solution of this equation inside the disk of radius r. Only there, though. But that, that's enough. Because again, this integration here, although I wrote here a complex plane, uh, it's actually enough to integrate over the disk of radius r, because we have truncated this. So then, when we know the solution of the periodic <coughs> equation, we can put it here, it coincides with this guy inside the disk of radius r, because that's all we need here. And then the left-hand side will tell us this guy anywhere, actually. And here, the point z in the reconstruction domain is just a constant. Uh, z is just wherever we want to reconstruct. Of course, we make a grid of points, but we can reconstruct even at one point if we want. z is just a constant in this computation, this is an equation in the, in the K planes. This is, I think, what makes the whole thing kind of complicated and not easy to grasp very quickly because there is the Z space, which is 2D, and there's the K space, which is 2D, and then everything is happening kind of in both spaces. And like, for example, this, this exponential function here, which is, which is defined as. <coughs> then even combines the two planes together. So that's kind of always in which part are we moving. Of course, I mean, you work in an even much higher dimensional spaces, but at least we, this is already confusing enough with this, with this two, this four dimensional situation. And then there's some extra, extra thing because of this complex conjugation here. It means that this operator here is actually not uh, complex linear. It is real linear, but it's not complex linear. So there's an extra little thing there that there are several ways of going around it, but one, one simple way is to just keep the real parts of the solution separately and then the imaginary parts. So for the CGO solution for the Schrodinger equation, we had uh, C 
64 at the space there because we could use complex numbers. Here we have to carefully separate these into this vector and then the, the uh, complex conjugation is just simple operation of adding minuses here. So it's a, it's a real linear operation in a way. So then we can use G and res again with the same kind of idea that we have these matrices we go in and, and we define this operation and we give it to GMRS and it will give us an, an, an answer. The D bar method, uh, numerical solution methods for it, I think these are all I, I know of it, all the studies. We started with, with uh, Jennifer and David. We, Jennifer wrote this, this neutron method in, in our first paper. Then we did uh, extend the Weinicko method in, 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 the, in the way I just described. And it was really valuable to get some, some, some insight from Marco Huhtanen, who works in, in these iterative solution methods. He said, that, how, can, how are you using GMRS, although it's not complex linear? And at that point, we, we hadn't realized it. And oh, oh, actually, yes, we have to do it more carefully. So we did it by these real and imaginary parts. But actually, this group uh, developed a special made GMRS method, really developed for this kind of uh, uh, equations that have the complex conjugate. Okay, Peter Muller, uh, former student of Jennifer Muller's, not related, <laughs> uh, wrote a finite difference method, and this is a very new paper by Klein and McLaughlin where they use a different approach. Then I would like to tell a little bit about the current situation of the D-bar method, what's going on. It's quite an active uh, topic of study these days. And because there are lots of things are missing. Of course, one thing is going from 2D to 3D. That's a big, big thing because people are three-dimensional. I mean, most objects are, uh, although often two-dimensional imaging works just fine for, for many applications. But apart from this 2D, 3D, Thing. Uh, even in 2D, there are many uh, things to consider. For example, uh, we cannot always measure all around the object. For example, an intensive care unit patient uh, who is unconscious and maybe very sick, it may be not so good to turn the patient around and move. So we could, instead of having the electrodes all around the chest, we could just have electrodes from here to here. So then, then the backside would be without electrodes. And also for underground measuring, or maybe measuring through a wall, what is what is there behind the wall with electricity. In such cases, we always only have a part of the boundary where we can apply currents and measure. So there is some recent recent uh, progress on that front. Jennifer Mueller's group they have they have uh, analyzed the theory of the D-bar uh, equation. Uh, a bit more in detail, and they found that instead of having the constant function 1 as the asymptotic condition, they can actually take one step back in the derivation of the d-bar equation and see that since we are truncating anyway, so actually the constant function 1 appears as a kind of a limit when r goes to infinity. However, if you don't take the limit and keep r where the stable disk is, uh, you can actually, or actually even a bit bigger than the stable disk, you can use, if you happen to have, uh, for example, like uh, CT images or other uh, high resolution images of patients, uh, you can use that as a priori information, uh, driving uh, the solution and giving maybe better, better edges. So that, that's quite an interesting development. And also in Jennifer's group, uh, Melody, actually, Melody just got married and she's Melody Alster now, so say Melody and she. Well, they too, they wrote a real-time version of the D-bar method, so it's really, really fast these days. Also, I mean, in practice, the measurements are not done by uh, static electricity. They are done by uh, alternating currents. <coughs> that means, actually, that, that there's an impedance with real part and imaginary part. And now, I will, just in the next slides, I will show three variants of the CGO solutions, and only one of the variants introduced by Brown and Ullman actually naturally extends to 
complex value of coefficients. And there, uh, it has also shown that it can be used in numerical computations that push into the finding both the real part and imaginary part. There's some, some works also in 2D recovering uh, anisotropic cases and also several works where the blurred images are tried to be resharpened uh, afterwards. And this one I will talk a bit later more. A couple of words about these different, different types of 3D <coughs> solutions and what's going on there. Namely, there was a, a race on the pure side of inverse polarized map after Nachman's uh, 96 paper for twice differentiable conductivities to reduce the regularity of this coefficient uh, to approach the more practical case of piecewise constant or piecewise uh, smooth conductivities. But anyway, this was the first paper by Nachman, so he provided uh, uniqueness and infinite precision data reconstruction. His student Liu uh, proved conditional stability and then uh, in this paper I described today, we prove that it's a regularization strategy. And on the computational side, we started in, in 2000, and actually there have been several, several uh, advances on that side. And then, very soon after Nachman's paper, came this paper by Russell Brown and Günther Ullmann, where they used uh, two by two systems. Uh, equations for two by two matrices, uh, I think uh, arising, if also you can, you can say that uh, these solutions were used also in the novikov vesselov equation, was some kind of a generalization of KDV equation. Uh, these Brown and Ullmann solutions that are, are two by two systems, they are related to so-called Davis-Stewartson equations that are also nonlinear two plus one dimensional evolution equations. And also Elisa Francini uh, showed in 2000 that, that uh, uniqueness extends to complex value with small complex part uh, in the conductivity. Also there is some work from Madrid and Beretta and Francini uh, uh, together did uh, also some, some further stability estimates. There is yet no regularization strategy for this case but there's a lot of uh, computational work, uh, especially because this nicely extends to the complex valued case, which is practically quite interesting. So then, there was the, the uh, breakthrough paper by Kari Astola and Lasse Bajvarinta. Uh, I think they published it, uh, I mean, they made it public at this point. I think the actual publication year is a bit later. <laughs> there was some, some delay. But there they actually showed uh, uniqueness for L-infinity uh, conductivities. That was kind of the uh, desired one, because anyway, in the direct problem theory, it's natural to have the conductivity in L-infinity. So they could prove uniqueness there. Uh, also, again, lots of deep work from, from the Madrid group showed conditional stability. Regulation strategy approach is still open. It seems to be a rather difficult technical problem. I know several groups have been thinking about it, but uh, so far, no known progress. Uh, we did some computations uh, first. We just computed uh, some, we, we computed that this is based on so called belt framing equations, these CGO solutions. I will describe them in more detail uh, in the next part. So we first uh, implemented numerical using the very definition of Astola and Bajvarinta. Then actually Huhtanen and Peramäki, these GM REST experts, they found that some uh, nice reformulation, uh, so mathematically I would say quite a trivial reformulation, but computationally it made everything, the computation, 100 times faster. So extremely nice, and this allowed us to try out reconstructions with this method, and also with this one, with Juan Manuel Reyes, again uh, from, from Madrid, um, we, we computed also some, we analyzed the Gibbs phenomenon related to this. So we analyzed what happens if we make the truncation radius bigger and bigger, 
what kind of convergence do we get for these continuous conductivities? That kind of situation. But then it turns out that actually the reconstructions from all of these three kind of solutions look the same. There, there's really, of course, we hope for for this this theoretical reduction of, of regularity that we would get sharp <coughs> images. This is not the case, however. The truncation in, in the nonlinear Fourier side must be done in each of these methods. And similarly to a linear low pass filtering, it will blur the images and they look very much the same. And I have a conjecture that, that I think maybe they are all computing. When there's a truncation, I think they're all computing the same thing. So far, there's no proof of this, it's, it's more a conjecture side. So that's, that's one reason why I, why I explained to you the deep bar method based on the Mahmoud approach, because that can be explained maybe in the simplest way, and from the EIT imaging point of view, the images are as good as with other methods. Actually, even with this, um, with the transport matrix method of this paper, which I find really beautiful, it's a really, really beautiful argument they use there, Unfortunately, in, in imaging practice, it, it doesn't work so well. There's, because there's some kind of a pivot point a little bit outside the domain that they use to go from solutions outside the domain, they can, they can solve them to inside the domain. But then the image quality is better near this point outside uh, the domain. And, and so, yeah, it's... Anyway, so, um, in regular EIT, it seems that it doesn't much matter which one you use, except that numerically it's not so good to use a transport matrix approach. Okay. And yeah, just to comment that all of the code, well, you will get the codes today in the, in the computational session, they are freely available, so if anyone wants to try it, and also if you want to work with, with the other kind of CTO solutions, for example, the bail from me, I, I can also view codes for them. Okay. At this point, do you think, are there any questions or comments or... I, I just mentioned things about the image quality, for example. Would you like to see some examples of that one? Or should we just go to the next? Okay, well, let's, let's look at this. Let's look at this part and, and see what thoughts it may bring up. So this is something very new, although um, this project uh, we started started with, with Matti Lassas and Alan Greenleaf, Günther Ullmann, actually already in the year 1999. Uh, and there were great technical difficulties. Uh, and uh, at some point we also took, took in Matteo of Santa Cesaria from Florence originally. And, uh, and Andreas has recently been doing some partial boundary computations. The thing is that what we attempt to do here was extremely difficult to do with the Schrodinger-based uh, CGO solutions. Then it, it was a bit easier with the brown Ullmann case, but still no breakthrough. With the Beltrami equation, there was some progress, but then finally, actually, like I soon explained to you, this trick of Huhtanen and Peramäki that was meant for numerical purposes. Actually, that one opened, opened uh, the way how we, could, how we could do this approach. And here, our, our motivation is the one I already talked to you a little bit about, that we would like to see inside, in the brain, whether there is too low conductivity uh, with no blood, with ischemic stroke, or if there is bleeding, so it's higher conductivity with too much blood. And the main difficulty here is we should see through uh, the skull, which is resistive. And the signal from inside the skull is very weak because there is this resistor in between. So maybe it's needed to have new methods. However, these works are quite promising. It seems that EIT uh, is able to, to see uh, details even inside the skull. Yeah, I showed you these ones. So then I prepared, again, three two-dimensional patients. So this is like a, the resistive skull, this one. And there's, you see, some little, uh, little, actually there's some smooth variations, a little bit 
brain shaped, but because of the of the display, it, it's a bit like piecewise homogeneous. So I made one ischemic example with low conductivity and another one with higher conductivity. So simulated examples, and with these ones, I would like to show you a video. Let me run this through first once. So see, there's something, something like X-rays, uh, look, looking like X-rays, and like like I showed you in the X-ray part of the talk, seems to be some projection images going around. Let me now explain in more detail what what is this situation. So we have these three examples here, and I'm showing here some kind of a profile function. Which, which kind of appears to come uh, as integrals along these x-rays. There are no x-rays, of course. I mean, these, these, these functions I'm showing here uh, can be computed from the EIT boundary measurements, so electrical measurements. Uh, but the technique I'm about to show you actually results in, in signals here arising from jumps in conductivity. And in this direction, I mean, we, we analyze if the conductivity has wave front set. Now the wave front set, uh, for example, at this point, uh, there is a jump along this curve, so there's wave front set at this point to this direction. And when our virtual x-rays have this orientation, they are picking up this point here. So actually, when we think of moving inside the domain along this line here, there's a dip down. This dip down happens when the conductivity value drops down inside the bone. And then it jumps up again. This is another signal signaling that now there is a jump up. So this is a kind of x-ray image of the wavefront set somehow. In this case, we see first the same thing than here. We see the skull dip down, dip up, and after that one, we see that, okay, there is a drop down, meaning that there is a conductivity goes down, like in ischemic stroke. Whereas, again, here, the only difference is the conductivity higher. Here, this actually jumps up. So, if we could, if we could see these profile functions from the data collected in the ambulance, we could see it through the skull and see what is behind there, and is it up or down, which medicine do we give uh, to the patient. This is the hope. I can inform you immediately at this point that this picture here I computed using the truncation radius uh, 60, so 60 in the nonlinear Fourier space. This is completely impossible from actual EIT measurements because you remember the regularization strategy says that when, when you have some noise level, if you have bigger noise, you have to take a smaller truncation radius. And in, in practical devices, EIT devices, Usually, the truncation is at radius 4. Maybe if you have a really, really good device, maybe you can push it up to maybe 5 or something like that. The thing is that if you want to go a linear step in the truncation radius, for example, from 4 to 5, in the measurement, you have to have one more significant digit. So there's an exponential relationship. This is the well-known exponential ill-posedness of EIT that is shown up. Uh, there. So this is uh, too optimistic, but we computed these pictures. We kind of want to see uh, theoretically what seems to be possible, or kind of in simulation studies. And maybe as a funny, funny uh, detail, for computing this video, I used ten years of computer time in parallel. Ten years of CPU time to compute this stuff, because I had to compute this belt from CGO solutions with very fine grid uh, to, to capture all the, all the um, fine details. However, when this technique is used in the ambulance and with the EIT data, it, it's really, really fast. We, solution of the boundary integral equation is really fast to do. So this is only for this kind of uh, <coughs> computational science study of what these functions seem to look like to back up theory. Okay. So, the same definition than before. 
we have the sigma, but this time we really ha can have a uh, feature before, uh, can be detected. Yep. Yeah. The picture? Yeah. Uh, so you see why the difference in the temperature before? Yeah, I think maybe we have to a little bit. Oh, okay. Yeah. So why you see the difference in the in the second? They look more than the same, but oh. you have uh, two peaks in the barracks and... Uh, yeah, because it, when, you, when you enter the material here, the first, this down peak, this signals that there is a drop, drop down, which is when you enter the, the bone, the skull bone. This peak is when you come out of the bone and go in, into the brain. And then after that, there is, there is nothing. For these guys, there's the same peaks, this peak and this peak, so this and this, and then further, instead of going straight like this one, there is there is this local minimum point, telling that okay, there's there's a deep down. So if you look, where is this? It's along this line, so it's along the boundary of this blue thing. So it's kind of saying that okay, there's a lower point that we did. And here again, you have the this <coughs> one and this one from the bone. Now, after the bone, and you know, geometrically, you know, because these are straight lines, you know that, okay, this is where the bone is, and then here you know that you are inside the brain. So, this tells you, instead of dropping down, this jumps up. So, then it, it means that along this line somewhere, the conductivity has uh, jumped up. So, now either you can think of using this data as just these profiles, knowing this one, but also I will show how to write a kind of radon transform to use all of the data going around and, and reconstructing the inside. Right now we don't know which one is better for this stroke application. Maybe it's quite okay to just do it, 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 it from one side and, and see what happens instead of doing the full reconstruction. Because again, there is some blurring going on. And also here, like I mentioned, the truncation radius, radius business that here it's 60 but in reality it's 4. The way to think about it is that this is actually the result uh, of a window fully transform. Here with the window going from minus 60 to plus 60. Uh, but if we have to then take the window on the fully side from minus 4 to plus 4, then this will be very much convoluted, this one with, with a very wide why convolution curve? So these peaks will be very much blurred. So then there's a quite, quite uh, difficult deconvolution problem, but one-dimensional actually in this case. So okay, then I these ones you see it saw <laughs> already. These ones we saw these ones. So let me explain what's going on now here in this connection to the radon transport. So uh, actually behind all of these CGO solutions, these different three types I explained, uh, you can, for a minute you can ignore is it the Schrodinger or is it the 2 by 2 system or is it the from the equation. You can think about the, actually the solution of the conductivity equation. Each of the CGO approaches is looking for a solution of the conductivity equation that has such an uh, exponential behavior. And here how I wrote it is that uh, I take uh, a direction direction in a complex plane, so this is a unit, unit complex number, this theta, and I write a complex number in a polar form like this, so there is there's i and then, then tau and theta, so tau, tau is the length, and then um, we define an eta vector in C2 with such, such definition. So then what happens is actually that eta dot eta, the dot product will be zero. So this is nice for, for defining uh, harmonic functions. So eta appears here, so eta dot x is here. So such an exponential function, uh, such an exponential behavior we want in u, so there is the leading exponential behavior and then some w 
functions that somehow close to one in, in, in some technical sense. So each of the different CGO approaches give some type of, of, of uh, U solution actually, depending on, on the regularity of sigma. So for the Schrodinger you need a couple of derivatives, but with the Beltrami approach you don't need any derivative. So then, assuming we have such a, a solution of the conductivity equation with, with this behavior, we can make a little computation. We can try to see what is the equation for this W guy. So we can uh, apply the uh, conductivity equation operator and some extra, extra multiplier here. And then after a little computation, we see that there is such a stuff times the exponential, which is non-zero, of course. <coughs> so then we see that uh, W actually satisfies uh, this PDE. And now we do a trick to this PDE. We, we do a um, one-dimensional Fourier transform, which is behind the whole, whole trick here. Namely, we take the Fourier transform of, of this uh, W, uh, x tau, so w x tau is here, we just apply the one-dimensional Fourier transform. So this is like, like it was the kind of a polar, the, the complex uh, parameter was written in, in a polar form, so we fully transform over the tau part. So we get this one, and from this equation, we then come to this equation, where we see that this multiplication by tau becomes uh, a derivative. Here. And now, actually, we can look at the principal part of this operator. So we have this equation. Principal part is this one, and this is a, a special kind of principal type. If we look at the theory by Duistermann and Hermander, where they studied complex principal type operators, I think in the 1970 or around that time. So the, the way to think about this kind of guys is that for real principal type operators, like the wave operator, singularities propagate along lines, like, like light rays. But these complex principal type operators uh, are a bit different in the sense that their singularities propagate along two-dimensional planes, called leaves. So it's, it's a bit weird, I mean, not the same physical idea than with light rays, so the, these are singularity uh, planes. And we see that, especially now in the two-dimensional EIT case, this can be used in a very nice way. This is a picture which is very uh, typical of, 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 of what we're doing here. Uh, what you see here is the idea is that uh, we have a conductivity which is rotationally symmetric, and it has a jump on one circle only. The vertical uh, axis in, in this uh, 3D picture is the pseudo time. We had uh, the pseudo time, this one. And the picture shows some of these leaves of singularity propagation. So what happens uh, in this context is that uh, we, we did choose some direction, theta, the complex, unit complex number that gives a direction. So now the direction actually uh, is um, in this picture how to how to mm, the direction is somehow kind of perpendicular to this magenta plane, but but still horizontal also is plane. But anyway, if, if you turn theta, this magenta plane will will turn. But with fixed theta, uh, it has some orientation like this. Uh, it goes through the origin in this 3D space, this magenta guy. And now, at this point, it hits a part of the wave front set uh, of, of the singularity uh, of the conductivity. So the conductivity has a singularity along a circle, but the circle gets uh, copied to, to all verticals. So it's a, it's a pillar, like a cylinder uh, of singularity in the conductivity. So now this magenta leaf hits, at this point, it, it hits the correct uh, direction of the wavefront set of, of the blue pillar. And same thing happens here behind, I mean the symmetric point of this one. 
here, but the slope of this magenta thing is two. So uh, here it creates actually one horizontal plane, and then on the back side, which is lower because of the slope two, it creates another uh, horizontal uh, leaf. So this along these leaves starts uh, singularity propagation. And there are also more leaves, but here we show only the first ones. Okay, this, this one. Uh, so now I need some technical background to go more into the leaves. So now let me introduce how Astala and Päivärinta introduced the Beltrami style CDO solutions. So they started looking at this Beltrami equation where mu, and now again, sorry, this mu is not the same as in the Nachman theory mu. This mu is computed from the conductivity by this very simple formula. Resulting uh, in the case that mu is supported inside the unit disk, and in, in L infinity norm, it's less than one. So mu is such a coefficient in the Beltrami equation here, and we are looking for solutions f mu that satisfy this one. So there's d bar uh, of f mu equals the Beltrami coefficient, and then d of f and conjugate. Such an equation. When you study this equation a bit more, uh, you actually see that because the conductivity is, is hidden here in mu, you actually see that the real part of f satisfies the conductivity equation with sigma. And the imaginary part satisfies the conductivity equation with one over sigma. And also, an extra thing is that if you, in this equation, if you replace mu by minus mu, then actually everything is, is symmetric. If, if you change mu to minus mu, you also change sigma to one over sigma. So, we are using these two sets of, of uh, Beltrami solutions. Actually, Astala and Taiverita showed that from the Dirichlet to Neumann map, you can uh, recover the traces of both of these guys. Even if you measure sigma, you can find uh, the CGO solutions of 1 over sigma. There is a connection between them. Okay, so we are looking at these kind of solutions that have this exponential behavior here, and we write such an asymptotic situation that we have one plus something small, well, small in, in this sense. So such solutions we, we want to use. So these were actually constructed when the paper came out in 2006. So the same three years. <laughs> they announced it in 2003 and it came out in 2006. Uh, well, I think I already explained this one first. So numerical construction, EIT, they made the new uh, change to the definition, and then, yeah, we did the experiments. Okay, so now in this case, we do the one dimensional Fourier transform trick. So let me write now k in, in this form tau times e to the ip for a form. And I write uh, them explicitly the tau and e to the i pi like this. So then we do uh, then we do uh, the Fourier transform in tau. So we get this one, and this phi is just an angle that, that gives the direction that we are watching. Actually, it gives the direction of these virtual X-rays we saw in the in the video. And now let me show you. First, a little bit of similarities of this function. So there is already the Fourier transform done. Uh, I take not not t but t over two, because actually this magenta uh, thing has slope two, so I have to counteract it. And this uh, one here just means uh, the first one. The first one here means that uh, in the conductivity space I take z to 
to be the complex number one. Uh, and then this one tells me, because we have this k equals tau times i pi, I take pi to be zero. So I'm looking at this direction here. So this is direction of k. In the top row, uh, I have conductivities. I take rotationally symmetric conductivities, three of them, and this, this function uh, I show here below. <coughs> so this is just a smooth conductivity <coughs> with no jumps. Then I just introduce a jump. I will just cut it here and, and, and drop it down so there's a jump. And here I may make another, another jump here. So let's see, what do we see? So, here uh, it's some, some smooth function here. Now when we uh, add the jump here, exactly at the location where this jump is, we see a quite sharp signal here. And also this side, but well, not symmetric, so this is a smaller one than this one. And same here, on this side we have big signals from these two, and here uh, a little bit smaller signal, which is something like this. Now, also, also in, in the middle we see something, although there is nothing uh, in the waveform set, we still see something weird. What we can do is we can actually use the minus type, this uh, CGO solution corresponding to 1 over sigma. We can subtract these two guys, and that will get, get rid of this uh, nasty nonlinear artifact uh, in the middle. So that, that helps us quite a lot. So now we just see some some signals from these uh, jumps, this one and also this one, and, and still, still the asymmetry. And now I must say, I, I should, I think, I think uh, my plots are unfortunately reflected. I think the thing is that we should see, you know, there's the jump curve, I think we should see this closer we should see this as a strong one, and this is more far away, this should be the weaker one. So actually I think my plot should be the other way around, so the strong one should be closer to this one. Sorry about that, I should, I should finally correct it. Then, uh, we actually arrive at this radon transform type idea. So here I define uh, an integral uh, <coughs> operator that we actually <coughs> Uh, integrate all information we have over the z-points. So instead of having just this, this one z-point here, we saw the asymmetry, one of these points, but much stronger z uh, than the other one. So now actually, we, we keep this direction the same, but we let, we let z go around the whole thing, but this one, this one uh, stays the same direction. So we integrate of the boundary, and in the case of the unit circle, um, we, we have such a situation that we integrate from 0 to 2 pi, and we have this complex measure here. So we are kind of taking a complex linear combination uh, of these guys, so we are summarizing all the information over the whole boundary here. <laughs> so then, we get something quite nice. So here, no sharp peaks, this is just a smooth one, so kind of also here is smooth. Uh, the jump here gives quite a sharp information in this kind of asymmetric fashion, up and down. And, and here, similarly, this one and this one, although of course it's a bit, uh, I mean, this could also be thought of as some kind of signal from a jump, but, but anyway, the actual jumps, they give quite sharp ones in these positions. Okay, this one, I will jump over. And then, one idea what we could use this for, or why this would be useful is, it's quite a big field uh, to look for inclusions in conductivity in a known background. And often there are also other 
restrictions, like all the inclusions have to go either to more conductive direction from background or to less conductive. But if they are mixed up and down inclusions, some of the methods will fail in that case. So one nice thing about this approach is that we can see nested inclusions, so inclusions inside inclusions. There is no restriction in that, like you saw in, in this picture. There's one jump here, another jump here. We will get signal from both of them. Also, uh, there's a background here that, of course, it gives some effect, but we have an unknown background, and still, still we can detect. We don't have to, we don't have to know this one. So this method could have these kind of strengths over over the previous inclusion detection methods, and that's also why we are interested in this stroke project to see first to the skull, two boundaries given by the skull, and then we should see even beyond them, and in the unknown uh, brain background. So then, uh, let me explain a little bit about the uh, change that uh, Huhtanen and Perämäki made to the original definition of Astala and Päivärinta, which allowed both 100 times faster computation and also the, the analysis we have, the partial analysis we have for this method I'm talking about. So let's go through first how did uh, Arkala and construct these solutions in the first place. So this is what needs to be done, such solution with such uh, asymptotics. So they define, so this is the same function that uh, Nachman used, this kind of exponential. Uh, so this is real value part. So this is a unit unit size modulus one exponential. Uh, alpha function is minus i k bar uh, times this guy, and also involving mu. So this one is not uh, modulus one because there is this k. And this mu guy, this has modulus uh, well. This is it's not growing in k size. So this functions they need. Uh, also needed are the solid Cauchy transform, which is kind of the inverse of the d bar operator. So convolution, complex uh, complex numbers appearing here, so kind of convolution like that. And then the Berling transform that switches between the d and d bar uh, derivatives. Uh, it's given as a principal value in the graph uh, like this. So there has to be a limit, limit process here. So then, uh, this is the theorem by Astola and Päivärinta. They, um, they looked at this kind of uh, equation, this kind of, uh, they defined this operator K that contains first complex conjugation, then multiplication by alpha, which was the guy that was Growing in K. Then uh, there is an inverse operator, but this one can be done uh, by a Neumann series because mu uh, is mu mu is smaller than one in L infinity norm because mu is and this is norm one. So this one can be done using a Neumann series, and then there is the solid Cauchy transform in addition here. And then they uh, showed that omega, which, which was this, uh, this one that will give our, our solutions, omega can be solved for from such equation. You take the characteristic function of the unit disk, apply this guy, you get the right hand side, and then there is a Fredholm uh, equation of the second kind for omega. So that's the way to solve for omega. Uh, and then let me show you how Marko Huhtanen and Alan Peramäki uh, a little bit reformulated uh, this, this uh, definition. So they, they are looking for the same omega and they start by noting first that omega satisfies such an equation and then uh, they can they can first of all see that d bar of omega is supported uh, 
it's supported in the unit disk. So then, actually, they start working, they move from working with spaces or defined on all R2, they can move uh, to spaces defined on the unit disk. So, first of all, they define uh, a U with this formula. So then, if you know U, you can easily get this omega back. Uh, then they show that U actually solve this one uh, and this one, and then you can actually. So, if we denote uh, complex conjugation by rho, so that we have this kind of equation where we have identity plus a and rho is the complex conjugation operator uh, equals is explicitly given right here. And a is this quite quite a nice uh, simple operator or containing these well known well known things here. And then uh, they show that this operator is invertible in the space uh, defined on top of the unit disk. And this equation actually opens up uh, the way to study these, these um, uh, functions and these singularity propagations I was talking about. So now, using this uh, equation from Buchner and Peramaki, we can write actually kind of a scattering series for u, where u is, is this infinite series with the first one given input by this one, and then the next ones recursively like this. And also for omega, uh, we have we have a similar similar uh, scattering series that we can uh, easily easily uh, compute recursively. And now we have some, some results describing these uh, terms in this scattering series, helping to understand what is going on in, in, in this approach. So first of all, let's look at the same kind of uh, averaging operators we already looked at a little bit for, for the full omega, but now I define it with the J I define it uh, separately for each term in our scattering series. And we have a theorem saying that the number one guy, uh, this operator with, with uh, one, actually uh, acts like a radon transform. Of course, there's the complex, uh, complex measure here, so it's not completely the same. But anyway, you see there is a, uh, this one is like radon transform data. We have we have uh, mu, the coefficient coming from the conductivity. This T1 <coughs> takes uh, omega 1 and integrates like we saw, like I showed you how these uh, singularities appear when we when we integrate with this one. So it is kind of collecting uh, X-ray data in different directions. Direction given by this form. So then, uh, if we apply this back projection operator, so it is a joint of, of this guy, but what it's doing is kind of back projection with, with, with respect to the uh, angle form. So there is a kind of radon transform, kind of back projection, and then there is filter. It's just like the filter is back projection uh, in the classical X ray tomography case. Yes. The rectal hand side of mu. Yes. Uh, the domain of division of mu. What is the domain of division of mu? Mu is. The rectal hand side. Here. Yes. yes. This is. The way to think about this is that uh, mu is this one. So in omega. In omega. Mu is supported in omega. Yeah. Then the right hand side, mu, also omega. Yeah, yeah, same mu. Yeah. So we, we start with, with uh, the mu, which is defined. Mu uh, can be computed from the initial to the normal. Uh, let me, uh, so, uh, 
omega can be computed from. Uh, so the thing is, the thing is that uh, when we use this, when we use this in practice. What we can use, compute from Dirichlet Neumann map is T mu without this one. Without one. It means we're true. Yeah, yes, yes, yes. In practice, we cannot, when we do EIT measurements, inside the measurements, there is the full series. It's not divided into this part. This is just analysis that we do. So, in the measurements, the full series is there. And if we had only the first term, then we could have this uh, reconstruction. In practice, what we only can do is to put here T mu without the one, and then we have approximate reconstruction. And then the question is, <coughs> how big error do we make when, when all the other terms are also in the series? Uh, is there any meaning for this formula? So this is an idealistic formula if we knew this omega 1 term, which we don't know. So it means uh, how to extract to T1 from T2? No, we, we don't, we don't we know can't. how to do that one. No, we don't know. No, we don't know. It means that um, if we knew T1 of mu, mm -hmm. we would make perfect reconstruction. Yeah. However, we know T mu not T1. So then we can we can hope that the term number one is the most dominant term and the higher order terms are small. In that case, T mu is close to T1 mu. <laughs> it, yeah, so this is the open point in the analysis. We, we don't know. Theoretically, we don't know. Or what, what we know theoretically about these terms is that so about term number one, we know this one. So this is Term number one is like Gaudon transform. When we look at this, uh, when we look at this one, term number one is like Gaudon transform information. Term number two, four, six, and all even ones cancel out because we, like I showed you uh, here. So this is only plus side. We get stupid artifact. This stupid artifact comes from even terms. When we subtract uh, plus and minus lights, all even terms perfectly cancel. It's a theoretical. Yes, it's theoretically proven. They cancel. And we can see the cancellation that the, the artifact will disappear. Which is very nice because this artifact it, is non-linear when the uh, amplitude of the jump, uh, an amplitude of the conductivity becomes bigger, the artifact in the middle, this one, becomes dominant, becomes really, really big. So now we can cancel it. And we know theoretically that we can cancel it. So we know, so term number one, got on transform. Even terms disappear. Term number three, we have little information and higher order odd terms, very difficult to analyze, not yet done. That's the situation. Uh, and let me show you a little uh, evidence about the higher order term. We hope it's smaller, not so significant, but we don't know for sure. But let me show you this example. So the conductivity has a jump <coughs> along this circle. So it jumps from, from 1 to 10 at this circle. Again, I take d equals to 1 and then p like 0, like before. We, we have a picture like this, and let me show you this is what happened. So, uh, so this is just along the x1 axis. This is the pseudo time. So this is like a cut uh, in, in the picture. This is the slanted leaf uh, we saw in, in magenta previously. It has slope uh, minus two now in this picture. It goes through the origin uh, in this uh, space, pseudo space time. <laughs> so here and here is the circle of, uh, uh, of jump, so with radius 0 0.2. So here is a similarity 
and here is similarity coming from the conductivity. So now, this guy hits here uh, a singularity and it starts a horizontal singularity, which we can see in T1. It reacts to the, this, this uh, horizontal singularity. Also, this three a little bit reacts, not so much, so it's much smaller. These two are on the, I, I, I put them on the same scale, so you can compare the size. Also, here is another interaction point. There's a horizontal leaf, here's a big one, big uh, here and a smaller case here. <coughs> then, uh, this horizontal one extends here, it hits here the uh, singularity of the conductivity. So they will start another one like this. It will go down, here it hits again the conductivity, it gives a horizontal uh, higher order, uh, three order term. So there is no, no effect here, but here we have some effect from this guy. Uh, so this one, so, so, so this one, uh, here I, I blow up uh, the amplitude by the factor of 70. So you see there is something little there is here, but it's, it's, it's quite small, especially compared to this one. This is very small. So there's such a diagram of singularities propagating along leaves. And there's an infinite amount of these because there will be more and more. Here it will be another one. This, here another one. And then here and then another one. There's an infinite number, a ladder of, of, of these singularities. If the conductivity has more jumps, you can see it's a very complicated picture. Lots of, lots of singularities going around, it's, it's hard to prove what happens to the higher order interactions in, in this picture. So, so what we know so far is that this guy is like the radon transform. Uh, about the three, we know a little bit, we have some, some proof about that one. Uh, five and seven and so on, we don't know anything. But numerically, it seems that it's not such a big problem at least in, in some examples. So this is uh, the practical way of thinking about it, how, what to do. So we showed in this paper how to numerically solve the boundary integral equation. That's actually in another paper by Astor and uh, Here's a numerical how to solve for omega plus and omega minus at the boundary. Then we compute the Fourier transform, however, here, as before, we are only in some stable disk. Uh, so we know these guys for K ranging only in a, in a stable disk, like uh, with values 4, for example. So then, when we compute the Fourier transform, we have to make a window of the Fourier transform from minus 4 to plus 4, which is very severe. So we have quite a blurry information. However, uh, so, even if we had infinite precision, we would only have here the thing with the, without the one. So this contains the full series. So there will be approximation from that one, and also there will be approximation from the windowing of the Fourier transform. But this is now one, one case we can do. So here is, uh, with the filtering and, and with some extra uh, edge enhancement. Uh, this one reconstructed and this one reconstructed, but this is now using the truncation radius 60, which is very unrealistic, but just to see uh, what in principle is possible. Then uh, in practice, uh, with higher uh, truncation radius, we get something like this, but then actually we have to do something uh, it's very blurred, our sinogram, but here uh, we have some compressed sensing technique. We are developing still more how to, uh, how to sharpen the sinogram or do a deconvolution to counteract uh, the blurring. So then we can put to, to uh, field red back projection. And also another thing is that we don't necessarily 
have to reconstruct the full image, we can also reconstruct just these one-dimensional profiles that give information. So it's still kind of open what is the best way to use such, such an approach. And also, Andreas Hauptmann, uh, my former student, studied such a situation that we can measure only at the part of the boundary. Like also for the head imaging, we, we only work on part of the boundary. So he did some new approach in his PhD thesis uh, uh, using the Neumann to Dirichlet map because what, with partial boundary data, it's more natural to use Neumann to Dirichlet because we can curve in, on, in the inaccessible part of the boundary. We can make sure that there is no current because we can insulate, but we cannot make sure that the voltage is zero. It's much more difficult. Okay, so he he made some some. Uh, there is and here's just one example of those profile functions that from. But actually, this is still we need more studies because he could only uh, ignore twenty percent of the boundary. So then he gets roughly in the same position these spikes. So it's a initial progress, but more work, I think, is needed for this one. So to conclude, with this new method, it's nice that we can see inclusions inside other inclusions, and we don't need the background. And also, uh, let me point out that we, also with this project in mind, we did such experiments uh, with EIT data, putting some kind of skull here uh, and inside some inclusion. So such data we have openly available, so if anyone wants to try out with real data, we will also publish, uh, uh, soon we will publish easy to use also interface, how to use the DBAR method and CTO solutions for the real data, that kind of situation. So, that's it. Thank you very much for attending.